Ladies and gentlemen, our presenter this evening is Sean Langman. Sean is the owner and managing director of Noakes Group, Australia's leading general marine company, shipyards at North Sydney and Port Huon in Tasmania. Sean has spent his life around boats and, starting out as a rigger, has sailed all manner of boats from 49 dinghies to piloting what rocket for an attempt on the world sailing speed record. He is one of the country's most recognised yachtsmen and has competed in 29 Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht races. His Team Australia Orma 60 crew holds the record for the fastest fastest passage times from Sydney to Hobart and Sydney to Auckland. Sean can often be seen on the water as master of one of the Rosman ferries, at the helm of the Noakes-sponsored 18-foot skiff, or racing his Ranger 24 Vagrant around Sydney Harbour. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll pass you over to Sean Langman. <coughs> Okay, good evening. Uh, tonight my presentation is the Ferry Radar Preservation, a link to a once working harbour. I'm going to do my best to take us through the progression of radar and how she fits into a 2020 society, not so much the COVID 2020 society that we are experiencing, but how she has progressed through the past uh, 65 years to where she is today and how she actually conforms to the current answer regulations for small vessels moving about Sydney Harbour. Um, incidentally, she um, was built in 1947, uh, which was the year that our floating dry dock was actually launched as well. So that's just purely a coincidence. And one of the last talks that I gave about uh, the floating dry dock was, why would you preserve an old bit of kit? Why would you not build a brand new one. And I uh, believe radar is testament to being able to rebirth and continue on with something that uh, was particularly good in its day, and there's no reason why it cannot be good today. Um, my belief uh, in basic engineering and naval architecture is that there's some fundamental physical properties that the water is wet and the sky is blue, and if it worked once, there's no reason why it can't continue to work, even with uh, the technological advances which we have today. So I wish to go through the progression of radar. I'm sorry about this particular shot. This shot is actually kept on board radar and it, it goes with her certificate of being a maritime asset recognised by the Australian National Maritime Museum. The reason why I wish to show this shot is the vessel directly behind radar is known, was known as the Regalia, but it started life as the Rodney. Uh, she's famous, the Rodney, um, unfortunately infamous for a number of fatalities for her rolling over whilst going out to watch an American uh, cruiser leave at the end of the Second World War and she um, rolled over by an overloading of the upper deck and many people rushed to the side and uh, unfortunately she rolled over off Bradley's head. She was raised and went through a series of stability checks and was rebirthed as the regalia. So the radar in itself um, was built with a different form of stability, stability criteria and a lot from what they actually learnt from uh, the Rodney incident. Her GA, her lines plan, is um, something curiously we're actually using today uh, in all her stability checks. So as you'd be aware that we always start with a lines plan, uh, input the data from there. And what we are doing as well is that we're scanning her lines to see how much that she's changed through uh, proof of concept from her original intention of build and also how she will measure for today's stability. So radar was actually built um, about 100 metres from where I'm sitting right now, which is quite exciting for us. Designed and built by Reg Adams, Clayton and Company, shipbuilders and engineers in North Sydney. Reg Adams was famous for his seagoing trawlers. And I can only hazard a guess that uh, Charlie Rosman chose Reg Adams directly after 
uh, the Rodney incident to build a vessel that was going to be known not just for harbour usage, but actually could go to sea. She's actually um, in survey just to go around Sydney Harbour, not to sea, but I'd be very confident um, to take her to see what I've experienced with her. Curiously with her, she does not have much uh, internal trim ballast. Uh, she does have concrete in the engine room area, but that was fitted as were many, many trawlers um, of that area. And um, coincidentally, my 1880s built fishing boat in southern Tasmania, the old May, a lot of concrete in the build really to keep the boat a lot cleaner and uh, more functional and uh, to um, allow the bilges to stay drier. So just a little bit, as I said, I don't want to make this particularly just completely a history lesson. This is Berry's Bay in 1892, and the the shot um, in particular of the very large vessel up on the on the slipway there, the building slip, which is right in the middle there. That uh, vessel is where radar was built and where we relaunched her. So this is a, a launch day in 1892. In the background is a very famous vessel, Tingari or the Sobron. She actually ended up a boys' home in Sydney Harbour. Uh, so they put the lads out there and tried to teach them a little bit about rigging, but moreover, it was to keep them out of society and keep them keep them boxed up. That vessel now, um, through archaeological survey, is actually in the Waverton Park, uh, buried under a, a um, I was corrected the other day, I called it a, a field, but it's actually a pitch, because it's where they play, play soccer, however growing um, form of uh, football these days. Move on from that one. So, Berry's Bay in 1947. Uh, this, this photo only recently came my way. Uh, someone tried to correct me about the date uh, because of the cars in the streets, because they're all sort of 25, 30 year old cars for 1947. But we do know it's 1947 because just above the screen where I am, um, the right hand side of your screen where the pointer is, that actually is radar. And that's the year of her birth. So, the um, where I'm sitting right now, you take it over the up to the little building up left, left no, sorry, that's it. That little building now is still um, well where we are. We're directly below that at the moment, and that, that roof line is still there. So some things have changed and some things remain the same. Uh, further to the right, there's a, a, a sort of tower structure that was the oh, left, sorry the water structure that ran the steam-powered winch. Uh, the winch is still in place, but all the bottlers are now gone. So the slipway is still in place, the sheds have been changed, and radar, uh, in fact, still resides here. So this is the yard today. Um, the building that I was talking about is right, right there that we're uh, sitting underneath at the moment. The uh, various vessels, I particularly like this shot because it shows the diversity of the yard today. And um, really, if you look at that previous shot, which we won't show you again, but the previous shot showed all manner of different craft. If we start from the very northern end, the top of the screen, incredibly famous yacht that we've now got in restoration at the yard. That's the Mourner, Carol of Four. Uh, she was built at Morrison Sinclair in Balmain to a fife design from Scotland. Uh, we are restoring her at the moment and hope to have her relaunched in 2023 for her 110th anniversary. Uh, the LLCs are in birth here. Um, slightly to the right of the LLCs is the Team Australia Trimaran that was mentioned that has sent to, set two world records uh, under the guide of uh, Moak's employees. Just above her, the Yakimo that uh, won the Sydney Hobart race recently and it actually won the Volvo around the world race. Um, our tug Warren, which we used to move the floating dry dock around, um, a famous Nicholson ferry, which is now part of the Rosman fleet by the name of Proclaim. And when she was built at Morrison Sinclair in the um, early, early 30s, uh, when she was built, the foreman of the yard was afraid of electricity. So she was built completely by hand. Um, and then more so in the foreground, we've got SDS Young Endeavour getting a whole new foredeck in that shot. So it's still the diversity of the site, um, but with almost 60 trimarans, LLCs, 
um, intermingled with a whole lot of traditional craft. It's um, obviously modernised, but really stuck with the ethos of the originality of the site where there were so many varying uh, activities happen. The big change to the sites today is that not one drop of rainwater runs into Sydney Harbour from that hard stand and goes into a very large wastewater treatment plant. So environmentally, uh, the yards have come a long, long, long way in the space of 150 years, um, which we're quite, quite proud of. Back to the point in case. So radar on sea trials. So this is a particular good shot because the purpose of being was one to be incredibly stable um, after what happened with the Rodney. But moreover, the very low wheelhouse was designed so that she could get up under the Rosewall Bridge, which is quite a low road bridge. So Charlie Roslin decided that if he could get somewhere that no one else could get to, then uh, he had a vessel that could expand his services. So the wheelhouse is exactly the same height today, and it looks a little bit unusual today, but in that shot, she looks fantastic because the line is so good. If we go to the upper deck area, it will be noted that the bulwarks are quite well set inboard and not so far aft. Now, the rationale behind that, which came out of the Rodney investigation, was that um, stability tests were done at worst case scenario and found that if they moved um, the upper deck weights only less than 500 millimetres, you know, um, a foot and a half inboard, that the, in, the GZ curve went so far higher. So she was fitted with bulwarks um, and fitted as such with uh, quite a slope on them. So they're very difficult to climb over, uh, which was part of the problem in that era. And um, even today on charter, you'll find, um, dare I say, the young fellas with um, a little bit of beverage on board are quite keen to climb over the outside. <coughs> so radar had a top deck fitted. Um, the top deck as such is there, but the actual enclosure um, was fitted around about 1955. Uh, what's interesting is that the stability book has not been updated since its um, original stability um, curve that was done in the late 1940s. So what we're faced with now is obviously a change of um, weights on and weights off. Uh, through the refit, we found a lot of surplus equipment, especially in the four-peak area, and the way that we've done the refit, there's no free surface now because of the type of sheathing we put on the outside of the vessel. So we're confident that we've lowered the C of G from this shot um, and also confident that we've um, enabled her to maintain a higher level of stability because she does not carry uh, bilge water, and I'll get on to that as part of the engineering, the reason why she can't carry bilge water because of what we've done in the uh, sheathing process. So she was quite a different vessel in appearance in those days because the Swanson band um, always rusted, and that led to her problems. She was a ticking bomb. The problems that were facing radar in her future um, are well shown in this shot, and that's why the streaks on the top sides of the rust that you can see going down. She was launched as La Radar, and the reason why she was launched as La Radar, and you can see that on the forward section of the bulwark, her name board, the reason why she was launched as La Radar is because the name Radar was already registered on the Australian Register of Shipping. Um, well, in those days, it would have been the British Admiralty um, Register of Shipping. And uh, as time went on, La Radar, or Radar fell off the list and uh, Charles Rosman was able to rename her just uh, Radar. So in her livery, before we went into major refit, um, the famous red and yellow livery of, of Rosman Ferries, that's her and how she's uh, much loved. She was known very much as the Northwood Ferry, um, school children um, upon thousands and thousands travelled each day to school on her, and uh, she was well known in the 18-foot skiff circles and around Sydney Harbour in, uh, in that livery. Uh, we're jumping along, but we just, just to give you the shock and awe value, this is how we relaunched her in 2020 um, in, in front of the Opera House, um, as we'll explain why she was rebirthed in this colour a little later on. 
So going into the refit, um, she had, as I said, particular problems pertaining to uh, the way that she was built originally. She was incredibly well built out of, out of hardwood. Um, what's exciting about her decks is they came off the HMAS, First World War HMAS Adelaide, um, which uh, is all teak. And when she was broken up, Charles Rosman bought all the decks off the Adelaide and all three remaining Rosman ferries, the Radar, Regal and Royale, all have that uh, particular decking on them. The teak deck in itself, unfortunately, was attached with steel uh, dumps, spikes, and the sponson band and the actual um, sponsons themselves were through bolted with steel rod. The rest of the vessel was completely bronze and copper fastened. And even by way of um, an improving riding moment, her normal deadwood area underneath the keel line is actually a big long lead shoe, which is quite unusual given the error right at the end of the Second World War that that lead was made available. And I would say and suggest that that would have been uh, cast and smelted on the site. So this is um, technically what I wanted to talk about. Um, I've learned a lot about this problem through various timber boat restorations that I've done over the years. The generic term for it is electrolytic rot. Um, in simple terms, it's where you have steel, um, a ferrous metal, so not bronze or, or copper, something that can conduct a current quite readily and corrode. The uh, small shot in the top right-hand circle shows this sort of halo around the steel. And what it does is as the current passes through the steel and it goes through the process of, uh, of corrosion, it sets up its own electric current and actually breaks down the cellulose of the timber. And um, even though a tree is cut down, I still regard them as sort of a living thing. And um, we've spoken a lot in recent years about carbon storage and how a timber desk is still storing carbon. Um, and if we plant another tree, then that cycle continues. Um, timber boats to me are a living thing because they move. Um, they are a piece of machinery because they have moving parts, but uh, moreover, they still react to the environment such as many other living things do. Um, in the case of electrolytic rot, Radar had her whole big wide sponsons. The sponsons are basically there to come alongside um, wharves and docks and they extend the beam of the vessel. Um, they're quite handy, especially for today's era where you're going into circular key because the single hull ferries do tend to get quite a, uh, quite a roll up uh, from the other not so considerate ferries. Uh, and by having the wider sponson band, it stops the superstructure actually uh, hitting on the wall. So the refit that became what we call the half-life right, life refit that started some years ago, uh, started with just what we thought was going to be the replacement of the sponson band, and it grew somewhat from there um, because what we found... Uh, next shot, maybe. Uh, go back to... Please. So what we found is where the Swanson band was completely around the whole vessel is every single stanchion, which is where those clamps are that hold the upper deck structure in place, every one of those was affected by electrolytic rot by the Swanson fastening that travelled through the upright bands, or sorry, stanchions, which actually uh, shared the load and the very up plank, up, upper plank as well. Um, was completely degraded. So effectively, we had a complete separation from the superstructure uh, to the primary structure of the ribs and uh, four and a half stringers because uh, there was basically a gap in space of, of mush, which was this heavily, thanks, Rob, please, but this heavily degraded area of timber. So the refit. Um, escalated from where we started to uh, go back into the shed. Um, the, we turned the corner uh, fairly rapidly because we had a date to a, a ball, if you like. Um, it's always great to have a date 
Um, like a lot of these things where you start, we had several ferries still in, in service. Uh, we, we had five ferries in service. We didn't necessarily need radar and uh, with the expense of other activities with defence compliance and uh, various other initiatives we're putting into the company, radar was effectively mothballed. So we signed up for a commitment for the Biennale and uh, we turned a corner with her in August uh, 2019, where we decided that we would relaunch her in 2020 in time for the Biennale. So for those um, that can see that shot, it's not what you're seeing at the very lower extremity of the keel um, is not an optical illusion. She has got a slight hog in the keel line there. And uh, we've fudged that as far as aesthetics go when we went up to the shear line and we've made the shear look aesthetically pleasing. And because of the way that she um, contracted through um, basically um, the water removing, the water removal from the structure, um, as she contracted and as she um, went back to her dry state um, from a wet wood construction state, then she actually ended up with a slight uh, hog in the keel, which we haven't fared out. We've left it as is. Uh, the radar back in the shed, I can see that. Okay, so we'll go back on. So radar was moved back undercover. This is a particularly good shot. Uh, good shot in the respect of we say on the electrolytic rot theme. If you look from the stem on the port side, those top two planks, and the actual stem post itself up high, inside where the bulwark is, if you see what looks like charred material, that burnt look, that is behind the sponson band. So we decided to fair out those pieces of timber and leave them in situ, um, but that shows you what it looks like when you actually remove the steel fastening. It looks like the actual area is uh, is burnt, um, but it's not burnt, it's, uh, it's rot um, from electrolytic action. So we use a combination of different skills. This is uh, Dave, one of our boiler makers. Right up forward, the electrolytic rot was so, um, the timber was so degraded, uh, we opted to not put steel back there, but to make a, a, a stainless steel frame in, in the bow section. Um, for those who understand what happens with stainless steel in this environment, um, it's fine. Um, it is no um, problems with, uh, lack of air and, uh, and air degradation, which then leads to corrosion. Uh, so we use 316 in, in these areas. Really, um, if I was to put my hand in my heart and say what's my preferred method up here, I would have laminated timber. Um, however, the timber problem in this area was just seriously time. So we worked within a timeline, um, similarly to when she was built. Uh, it's not cutting a corner, it's just looking at other materials that are adaptable in this area. There's a lot of timber work coming together right at the stem. If you can see the stem post there, it's a massive piece of structure. Um, the deck beams that went in and the four deck um, went in by way of a glued technology rather than wet wood technology. And by doing that, um, it, it's meant that that whole part of the vessel won't twist or yaw. Uh, and she had a series of tie rods in her to stop her twisting and, uh, and basically moving fore and aft. Uh, so what we've done now is we've stiffened the structure up by means of moving away from wet wood construction and moving to a dry wood construction methodology. Uh, the easiest way to explain that possibly, we'll look at the next shot, and might go back a few. Yes, this is a good one. Uh, so wet wood construction, there's a lot of timber work as you see here. So the fore and aft members there, so the very top one where it says radar refit, so that's our deck clamp or shelf. Um, in a yacht, when there's another structure going fore and aft by way of the chain plates, it's called a shelf. Um, when it's just fore and aft sitting there like that, um, it's we call it, um, uh, it's, it's basically the deck uh, clamp, uh, the deck and the top side and, um, and structure interface. So the vertical members are ribs and the four and a half ones are stringers. Uh, there's a lot of timber work there. And then everything's bronze fastened. Uh, the temporary 
through bolts you see there to pull everything back together before we put the copper fastenings back in and they're roved. Um, I, Belinda may be able to pick up a rove in the one below with the pointer. Um, there's a rove there. So it's a big copper, uh, not nail, but a big copper rod that's pinned over, then the rove slides over, and then literally you hammer it over while someone holds a dolly on the outside. So very laborious and slow procedure. So what we did in Radar's Reef is we moved away from wet wood construction. Now, wet wood construction is every single one of those planks that you may be able to see there. They're stacked up on top of each other, if you like, and they're just a butt, just the edges come together, right? and then they're, then they're fastened, and then on the very outside of the planking, we use a methodology called caulking. Now, that can be oakum in severe cases, but in most um, well-built boats, it's by way of using cotton, um, and that cotton is, is hammered in, a lovely sound actually, corking irons and uh, timber mallet. Uh, it's one of the sounds I miss very much from Sydney's waterfront. So that's hammered in, uh, and then we just pay the seam with putty. They put in the water, and then what they're supposed to do is get wet. Um, and what the water does is it makes that whole structure swell. Everything swells and becomes much tighter. So in the process of what we did with radar, we left her out of the water for a period of time. Uh, intentionally to dry her out. So what happens when you dry them out is that we ended up with all this uh, stack of sticks that aren't really working in harmony anymore. They're all working independently. We didn't go through and harden up every fastening. We hardened up some fastenings, but we moved away from wet wood construction and we moved to dry wood construction. So that means now that water within the structure is our enemy, not our friend. So the um, we we sell the shop there. Um, so the shop we see the splining shop. Go back to the splining. So the splining shop that's showed there uh, with a guy standing up on the plank. So we use what's called a splining saw. Uh, we ran fore and aft and opened up every single seam. Got rid of all the original nasties in there. So you can imagine back in the beautiful days of materials such as red lead. Um, and uh, tar and oakum, et cetera, all that was removed to get to a clean seam. Uh, those seams then were painted with a material called Everdure, and then within those seams, we put a softwood uh, spline. So she's built a hardwood, but we drove in softwood spline. So they're specially cut at a V, um, a special spline, and they're hammered in with glue. Um, the type of glue that we use is called glue fibre. Uh, so it's mix, mixed up specifically for the for the usage. They're very small fibres of uh, GRP. And so we don't start with chop strand mat. We actually start with blue fibre that's purchased. It's mixed up with a, a high temperature epoxy glue. And then we pay the seam <clears throat> where we push all the epoxy in and we get the wedge and that's hammered in. That pushes the glue all the way through the seam. And what effectively does from having a stack of planks stacked on top of each other, now we have a monocoque of structure. So from her deck line all the way down to her keel line, you can regard her now as one plank. So all that internal structure, um, albeit that it is doing something to help, is pretty much coming along for the ride and it's pretty much part of her overall displacement. Now, for those that understand these structures, the most problematic area of any carvel built boat or clinker built boat for that matter is the interface of the garboard plank, which is the very bottom plank, into the keel line. Because the rest of the structure, when it's wet wood construction, and even in dry wood construction for that fact, is able to slightly move about itself. When it moves down and that load path goes to the very end and touches that interface between the planking and the keel line, that's called the garboard plank. What happens in there, there's a, there's a adds doubt, so there's a, a, a type of machine or not machine, these days a power plane back in the old days, and adds, it's shaped out and the plank fits into that. And the way that they were fastened was a, a series of boat nails and the boat nails were made by getting a copper nail and twisting it and hammering that in hard. 
But what happened with all the structure moving, especially in sailing yachts where the low path is driving the mast straight down, is that the garboard plank can open up. So quite a bit of attention has to be put around the, the garboard plank area. So if we go back to what I said earlier with that slight hog in the hull, so if you can picture that we had something that had a perfectly adzed out, almost done like a machine. These uh, men that built these boats were incredibly gifted craftsmen and how they could stand up and use an adze between their feet and end up with a, what's called a chalk fit. So that the actual point you know, put chalk on each side, then put it down and see that it actually fitted correctly. And then it would be put on with a series of uh, tar and then, then hammered on. So by that slide hog, that means that interface of that garbage plank doesn't exist anymore. So the way around that is sort of a, a backwards motion um, where we backfill from the inside. We go between every single fastening along that garbage plank line. And we, in this case, put very long silicon bronze screws um, all the way down the keel line. Uh, so <clears throat> I've jumped into the whole fastening um, rationale. So we use silicon bronze screws in all the new planking. Uh, we didn't bother going through and roving everything. Uh, rationale behind that is we actually glued the plank onto the new um, vertical ribs that were fastened into the vessel. So we've got a combination of the very old technology, the way she was originally built and brought her into a modern uh, methodology. To my mind, sheathing and fairing, which uh, as an old shipwright once said, or he said to me recently, I was once infamous for it and now I'm famous for it. Um, it was regarded as the worst thing you could ever do to a timber vessel. Um, we've proven over the space of now 35 years of testing um, that it not only makes the structure stronger, but it gives the structure a much longer lifespan and uh, the less less need for maintenance. Now, the drawback <clears throat> is that we're only sheathing one side. Um, for ABS or, or ISO or IMO, um, that fiberglass doesn't give you a credit. Um, it's not part of the structure. Uh, we went through this with ABS with little Maluka when we took her in the Sydney Hobart race. We ended up having some more uh, frames in her because the fiberglass she sheathing did not give us a credit. Uh, so that was actually written by um, the ABS code was written by Herishoff. Um, and when Nathaniel wrote it, they weren't using much fiberglass. Um, so the ABS guide for timber boat construction which uh, incidentally British and Australian uh, boat building of timber generally fail miserably because what uh, Nathaniel worked out is that the planking needed to be quite small or could be quite small and the frames needed to be quite large. Um, the Brits like to have massive mucho grunde uh, planking and tiny little piddly uh, um, structure on the inside. So radar doesn't fall into that because um, she was built as a trawler. <laughs> so she was built, even though she was never um, retrofitted from being a trawler, she was built with that same uh, ethos and incredibly uh, heavily built. So we didn't use the fiberglass as a methodology of getting a credit. Uh, we put the fiberglass sheathing on the outside uh, for longevity and uh, also to give this really nice uh, buffer between the sponsor. So in the far right shot, you can see the sponsoring going on. Um, and what we did do, and I don't think we got a close up of that unfortunately, but what we did do is that we recycled as much as possible of the original sponsoring. Now, the reason why we did this is that she has quite a few different shapes. So four and a half is a shear. On the top sides, it has a slight tumble home. And where it goes round, towards the stern, there's a taper. When you go to the bow, there's a taper. So when you look at that three-dimensional shape, um, we stared at the original sponsons many times over a number of years, had many old, quite really um, wily, smiling old shipwrights that came in that um, sort of nodded then shook their head and said, old Bert on Cockatoo Island was the only bloke that could build those. 
So old Bert was gone, is gone now. So we really couldn't get our heads around how we're going to go about doing it. So it was a combination of using an ads and a massive steam box. So what we decided to do by using modern technology but using the original material is that we infuse everything um, in um, heavy layers of epoxy and glue fibre, uh, use long threaded rod, pulled it into the hull, and then we used modern material um, in many laminates of floated gum on the outside to build it up to, uh, up to shape, up to size. So this is the quality of the interior. Um, sort of an unusual shot because the white tank in the background is actually her black water tank. Um, I wanted to put this shot just to show how far we went. No one can see this part of the vessel. Uh, this is right up in the forepeak. There's no access other than through the watertight bulkhead. Uh, we go up there uh, for the sakes of checking things and checking pumps, et cetera, for the, for the black system. Um, we painted her to a gloss white epoxy finish. And the reason why we used the epoxy paint was to have a lack of water ingress. Um, I love doing this job. And the reason why I love doing this job is that every single one of those seams was lovingly with a very large brush, got a lot of paint worked into it. And the reason why I love it is that I know that it's keeping the water out. The obligation to sheathing is that there cannot, cannot be water in the hole. Because if we go from what was once a wet wood construction vessel, then make it a dry wood construction vessel with only that membrane on the outside, if we fill her up with water, water inevitably finds its way through any little nook and cranny. It'll find its way into that timber that timber will swell and could lead to catastrophic, catastrophic failure, having to say that word, of, uh, of the external membrane. Uh, we have sufficient layers of GRP to deal with that. Um, and if she reverted to wet wood construction, she would just leak, um, which um, is very, very manageable and it would never leak to the extent that she leaked when she was an everyday cable boat. So free surface effect, the a torch ship floors, which um, you can see down low, they're called floors. Those floors are through bolted all the way down through the whole Kielsen. Um, their reason for being there is mainly to support the garbage plank and the planks above that and transmit the load up the rest of the hull planking. Because as I said earlier, that garbage plank is fraught because it has no flexibility, so it needs, needs maximum support. So when she was back in her carval normal days before sheathing, you know, water would be up above those floors. So as she mowed it around, excuse me, <coughs> I'll have a cough in your hand anymore, sorry about that, folks. Um, as she mowed it around, that free surface would slosh around and move around the vessel. Um, and now she has none of that. So out of my heart, she's a far more stable vessel and when we go to incline again, which we're about to do, I'm sure she's going to pull quite a few more kilogram metres. Uh, so for those that love engines, um, and that's me in a few uh, kilos less there, which other one? What for the one on the wall? Um, so radar's engine story is, is, is quite fascinating. Um, we actually had numerous gardeners on site that had been collected over the years. Um, I love machinery for the sake of what they do, but I love the boats more that they go in than the machine themselves. Um, I've really enjoyed this process and, and curiously, the refit of this engine that happened in Auckland by an amazing company called Shaw Diesel over there, um, expat Pom, did all his time over in the UK learning about these enlisted diesels. Uh, curiously, when we sent the engines over to uh, New Zealand. Um, we were fortunate enough to be also working on the Young Endeavour mass replacement. Um, so we had more than one thing to look at whilst we were there. So we sent a whole lot of engines over to New Zealand. Um, this engine is identical. It's an ATL 3B. Um, she's identical to the original ATL 3 Gardner. Identical in way of the, the sump uh, size, the engine bed layout, the number of cylinders being eight, the exactly the same weight. Um, however, she's 40 years newer 
and 50 more horsepower, which is pretty cool. Uh, so her original engine was beyond economic repair, and um, <clears throat> well, I gifted it to Shaw Diesel, and I said, look, um, all I really wish to know is what happens with all these spare parts in the future. And since then, we've actually sent two old manly boat uh, generators that are gardeners over to Dave for free uh, because I like to see them rebirthed um, without economic gain for us. But I just, all I want to do is hear where they end up. So the original engine is now running a generator in, in Egypt. Um, now, running an, a generator in Egypt uh, might mean it's in the pyramid. So that's how I like to fantasize about it. So the changes in this engine from original um, uh, that the emission controls are a little better um, than what they were originally. Um, by the time it was fitted to the vessel, obviously, to, to fulfil the requirements of safety, et cetera, uh, various guards were fitted. It's just another nice shot. Um, so the engine install, so the engine looks quite huge outside. Um, inside, when she's fitted down, inside the vessel um, is, uh, is quite good. We built a, a special lifting frame so that we could get the head height we needed to do. Um, we had a series of cranes and a, a vertical lift going down through the upper two upper decks, um, as well as this frame to get it in through the side. Um, that's my background as rigging, so that, that was just a good fun day. Um, I think if we just go back quickly, oh, I don't know how I'm going for time here, but you can see that marriage of the different timbers on the sponson there um, with the original sort of blackened colour and then with some Douglas fir behind that and then further on some uh, flooded gum, which is much harder timber. So the Douglas fir, which is a softwood Oregon, you know it as, is mainly a packer before we get to the outside pieces as well. Um, so quite a curious refit because the upper deck painting and the graphics are going on whilst we're putting the engine in. And like a lot of these things, they work to a deadline and we really didn't have specific work for radar, but we had made a commitment um, to state government and the BNR. So the refit works. So we refitted the original tanks. So we blasted those, they are steel. Uh, we refitted those. Um, I kept thinking of locomotive um, through all this process and uh, steam locomotive, obviously, and something that people would like to see. Um, with the next little layer of her refit, we're putting a glass deck over the gardener and putting some uh, up lights and uh, having it out of bounds for engineers when we've got ladies' cocktail parties on, I think, so cool. Um, next shot. Yes. So all the uh, mechanical works and the refit that went in there, so everything's done to the latest AMSA regulations, fire suppression system. We opted to go away from all steel pipe work and went to stainless steel pipe work. What we've done, again, an obligation for the GRP is that the gardener actually sits in a completely um, beautifully built 316 stainless steel bath. Um, so the bath actually goes up to the sides of the gardener um, and captures anything. And there's an old adage about uh, English engineering that you never do a oil change, you just keep putting oil in them um, because they always have a leak. Um, she, at this stage, has been incredibly good. And um, the nice thing is that we can just go in there and just hand wipe into the stainless steel bath and none of that's getting into the bilge. Uh, I left the concrete in the engine room area. Uh, we cleaned all that and we left the concrete there, uh, put the new uh, aluminum, my favourite American word, deck plates over the top. And uh, for all extensive purposes, it's an incredibly uh, serviceable, um, in inverted commas, modern uh, engine room. So the refit and the artwork. Um, so I wish to talk about the artwork because it's quite dear to my heart. I approached the Biennale art show that's on um, every two years. Uh, Timing-wise, unfortunately, we did the launch on uh, the 4th of March 2020, uh, and within a few weeks, um, COVID obviously had taken grip and things slowed down. So our commitment to the Biennale was to fund the art piece 
um, launch the art piece and run Western Suburbs school ch children um, on the uh, art piece Cockatoo Island and talk about the interpretive work. So to explain the artwork and what this is about, um, it's really a statement of inclus inclusiveness. Um, it's really a statement of lost culture. And it's really a statement of the amalgamation and the marriage of two lost cultures. So unbeknownst to me, uh, with colonisation of the Pacific, um, the ancient art of tattoo was only performed by women. It was not performed by men and it was performed on women on other women and it was to tell the stories of their life and their cultures. Uh, so each of those um, graphics there, which come from various parts of the Pacific region, each tell a story. And um, the reason why I wish to do this as an art piece is that I felt that it was very fitting that uh, what's been happening over the course of the last uh, 25, 30 years on Sydney Harbour is we've had a massive displacement of shipwrights and our artistry of, uh, of building boats. So it's a marriage of, of what was once women's art and the marriage of what once was men's art. Uh, there is very many very accomplished uh, women uh, shipbuilders, engineers, naval architects today. Uh, but this particular marriage, I was keen to seek and uh, and work with the artists to do do it. Um, so, like um, in today's modern culture, and I'll probably sound sexist for this one, is that it was women's art, but it was applied by a man being me. And again, I wanted to do that. I wanted to paint it myself. Um, and the reason why I wanted to paint it myself is that um, the embodiment of the art piece itself is that um, I obviously have a lot of affection for radar and uh, curiously a few weeks before my head painter walked out and I made the flippant statement that if you can read you can paint. Um, so don't look too close, she looks okay from a distance uh, but she was a few late nights um, getting, that, getting that work done. So she was launched um, on my mother's birthday on the 4th of March 2020. Um, it looks so bizarre this shot now, this is a Indigenous women's um, smoking ceremony, um, which was uh, fantastic to do on site. As I said, uh, radar was built and relaunched exactly where she was in 1947. So that in itself was quite fitting. As I said, the shot in itself is quite bizarre now because um, no social distancing and we didn't know what was coming in front of us um, as at the time, um, the women didn't know what was coming to them uh, with the loss of this uh, particular art form. So this is the build team themselves. Um, uh, you know, black and white shop is quite quite fitting. Uh, we're very fortunate that this type of refit um, gathers all manner of different people. Uh, we had at any given time 38 people working for a very condensed time frame. Excuse me for one second. <clears throat> a very condensed uh, time frame to to bring it to her her this to this date. Um, so since June 2019, we did uh, 5,000 man hours at a labour cost of a half a million bucks. Um, work hours in the last four weeks before we got her in the water um, was 3,000 hours. We had 38, 35, or 38. <laughs> 35 people on the job and a few of us lurking around in the back. Um, a lot of apprentices were able to learn different uh, timelines, uh, in particular, but different ways of getting things done. A lot of different specialist contractors shows the uh, cost of the contractor uh, costs and um, the approximate value of the refit. And when we say approximate value, that's a cost of about 1.2 million. Um, in real sense, um, you could go far more than that, um, and her street value is nothing like that, but her value to heritage and value to connection of those various art forms is invaluable. And uh, we spent a long time doing it. It was seven years um, for that time, that uh, what we call the half-life refit. Her future now is, uh, is quite curious in that we're attempting to find a place for her doing um, 
those original runs that she used to do. Um, we uh, have this sort of passion now of getting places quickly. Uh, Rawson Ferries as itself is the only remaining timber boat ferry company compliant and able to work for Sydney Ferries. I love driving the ferries when we do those runs and what I love most about them is the number of people that get on and won't get off. Uh, I've sat on what's called the line uh, many times at 2 a.m. The line is between the end of the opera house and um, pretty much the bridge and you sit there and wait for your allocation of what dock you go into and uh, I've been sitting there and I've asked for my allocation and I've been asked to wait um, until there's a wharf allocation, I ask, what can I do with all these passengers? And the allocator says, well, how many passengers have you got on board? And I say, 160. And they go, why? And I say, because they won't get off, um, because they love so much and they all believe that uh, it's coming to an end. If you imagine, um, you know, running a, um, a steam tram down, um, what's, a, what's a decent, is it Flinders Station or something in Melbourne or, you know, down... Pitt Street in Sydney, if you imagine running steam powered, everyone want to get on it. And uh, I believe the future for her is that we will find some form of tourism route. Um, she's still going to be used for the Avian for skiff fleets. And uh, the intention is that she will go back to her original um, coloration. There was quite a bit of pushback, um, quite a bit of outcry um, as to the reason why I was prepared to take her to that color. Um, and that colour scheme. In my view, it is paint. It's not like a normal tattoo that's there for life. Um, it is paint and it does tell an interesting story in her rich tapestry of her time. And um, so go, go to some things I'd like to wrap up before we get to questions. Compliance mechanical has been very straightforward. Um, compliance to modern um, stability and damage um, stability and down flooding. Uh, we're working through. She's quite a unique little ferry and that, as I said, she is based on, on ocean-going trawlers, so she has quite a bit of freeboard, uh, has quite a few open um, ports at deck level, which put her into 1E. Um, we're looking at whether we should just uh, fit some um, you know, sort of watertight trainings on those, which I'm, I'm happy enough to do. I believe her incline will show that um, her VCG has come down significantly. Uh, coincidentally, I did move some trim ballast that was well aft and moved that to midships because I moved so much weight um, out of the bow that was uh, redundant uh, machinery uh, that was just sitting there from, from the old days. So overall, I believe she's significantly lighter in light ship. Um, and also significantly lower in VCG. So we are uh, just going through that process at the moment. Uh, she's got an operation of uh, certificate of operation, which I have limited her number to 50 from her 220. Uh, and that's just the seamanship um, side of things until we get through her last uh, incline. Um, I think my timing's okay. I don't know whether Phil's still with us. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Have I haven't put you to sleep, Phil. No, definitely not, Sean. I've been talking that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I hope I didn't put too many people to sleep um, during that. I think timing-wise, looking at my watch here, Phil, I'm about okay on time. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, if you're uh, ready, so I can start the um, the questions and answers. The first question is from um, uh, Jess Layag. It's, he's, he, he says... Uh, how would you ensure that the protective coating used can withstand the exposure to salt and no cracks will happen on the plank connection between each other? How long does it have to be dried under the sun to keep the protective coating in place? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So it's quite an interesting process. And if you've ever had the opportunity to go to the Mary Rose at the um, Portsmouth uh, Museum, they got a system of uh, sprinklers that keep her and uh, keep the atmosphere in a certain amount of moisture because if she was to dry out, um, it would completely just fall apart and degrade. So the process of drying, um, the last thing you want to do is put it straight out into the in the sun. 
So it is a slow process of drying. Uh, we do check the moisture content um, to get down to a level of less than 5% uh, for the sheathing process. In uh, swimming pools with osmosis, they use vinyl ester uh, resin um, because it's far more tolerant to uh, any moisture. Uh, we go to completely epoxy uh, for its strength, strength properties and um, it has no tolerance of water pretty much. So we go to that. We coat the surface with uh, Evergera to seal it, and then we go through the various layers of um, biaxial fiberglass. So it's not chop strand mat. It's uh, biaxial. It's got two axes. Um, we do that in a, in a systematic approach and then use um, material called quadaxial. Um, Really structurally, and as I say, it can't be regarded as far as being measured, but you could um, practically take the whole interior out and the planking and the boat would still, still be a boat. Um, so I just look at it as a sarcophagus that's there to stop the water getting in, um, but I also know through experience that it does add significant strength. I hope that. Others questions? Yeah, right, that's good. Um, Tony Weston says, I think this is rather a comment rather than a question. This presentation brought back memories of travelling to uni from Longerville in the 1970s. You needed to avoid the swells when at the bow. <laughs> well, it's, it's um, funny, the Longerville jetty, I was, supposed to, I was supposed to go there to be picked up last Sunday from a yacht, and they called it the Northwood uh, jetty. Um, which is uh, what it used to go under, and I went down Northwood Road and ended up at the wrong the wrong jetty. Um, but um, yes, it it was famous for for doing that run. But I think a lot of people liked uh, the whole getting on the bow, getting wet thing. And um, she's now a lot drier than what she used to be because, as I said, it's uh, there's less free surface travelling around inside her. Very good. Um... Noel Bartholomew says, thanks for the informative sessions. session, guys. Learned a lot. And so far, that's the, uh, the end of the question so far. If anybody has any more questions, please um, put them on the Q&A line now. Much easier with a live audience. Uh uh, <laughs> I'm just surprised that there's uh, so few questions. Um, you, you, you said that the um, engine was reconditioned um, by, um, was it Dave Shaw in New Zealand? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. He's pretty, um, hard to get a joke out of him. Pretty, pretty serious, pretty serious fella. Um, and I've always seen engines to him and it's sort of like, I guess you know, I'd send them for free, and he's he's forever asking me what the catch is, um, and he's one of those blokes that I know doesn't want to feel obligated, but I just feel an obligation to make sure that the machinery is maintained. Um, and look, and I, for my sins, I've got I think I've, I think I've hit forty boats now. Um, I've got quite a few boats, but I don't really wish to be an engine collector. <laughs> as well. Um, no, Dave Shaw at Shaw Diesel in Auckland, uh, his son's actually taken over the whole of the Pacific region uh, Lister agency as well. Okay. I, I know that at the um, Eden Killer Whale Museum, they've got, a, I think it's an 8L3B gardener, and um, it's in pretty sorry condition. I don't think they're ever intending to... Um, uh, to get it back into working order, but it's there on display. Yeah, well, if it um, if you can bar it over, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will run. <laughs> what's um, What's really interesting about them, Phil, is that I once bunkered um, her at Woolwich Dock, and an old mate of mine, Dave Kellett, um, came for a run with me. And yeah, the bunkering procedure is you close all fuel ports. And uh, I inadvertently left all fuel ports closed 
and uh, just got out in front of Humbug there, um, in front of all this dock, and she um, she ran out of fuel. <laughs> and uh, and I thought, oh my god! Like, look at the size. As you can imagine, bleeding it. Um, so in a panic, I um, you know, was sort of drifting. And Charlie Rosman wasn't known for anchoring systems. He said that customers don't want to stop; they want to keep moving. So <laughs> he didn't really. Well, she doesn't still have a you know very efficient anchoring system. And um, so um, I rang up one of the old engineers and said, "What do I do?" He said, "Just open the fuel up." And I said, "What do you mean, open the fuel up?" And he said. Open the fuel up and crank it over. Uh, did that and they self bleed. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah oh, so wow. You won't get away with that with a modern diesel. No, that's right. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Um, what have we got here? Uh, I think we've got some more questions coming in here. Um, Arvin Jess Layarg says, uh, like in metal coating, oh, hang on. My Q and A box is moving around. Um, like in metal coating, was there any holiday testing done, and what, and at what layer would it be? It's a holiday. You know what that means, Phil? Holiday. Not really. Like in metal coating, was there any holiday testing done? Like well, the holiday is like the main uh, area. Uh, just, what layer would it be? Yeah. So testing for. Testing for degradation. So it's a it's a fairly straightforward test, and you see it in small backyards. Actually, you see it with naval hull surveyors. Naval hull surveyors are pretty famous for it, going around with their little hammer. Um, you know, they've got the they've got the spike on one end, they've got the sort of ball painty um, hammer on the other end. Uh, it's the same thing with timber boat. You know, we go around and go, you know, thud thud clunk, thud thud clunk. It's the same thing you tell for. Degradation. So, in the case of those severely degraded degraded areas, we we change the planking out completely, and all of her timber that was sourced originally, and that that's part of the beauty of um, older built vessels, is that there was much better material available. Uh, so it's all very close grained old growth timber. Um, the mourner that we're doing at the moment built a teak. Uh, I don't believe we're going to replace more than five percent of her original planking from 1913. So oh. yes, um, the breakdown of cellulose of the timber is a major concern, and um, it really is akin. Um, it's the worst form of rot that I've ever seen. Um, dry rot. My old man said so many years ago: stop the water and you stop the rot. Um, so you chop that bit out and you put another piece in. We didn't show a lot of the areas, but areas that had actually suffered around exhaust outlets that have been leaking exhaust over the years, um, they now got big diamond shaped, what we call gravos. Um, so you use a, you mark the area out, you use a hammer and chisel, and you go down each layer until you find good material, and then you put a, what we call a brick back in. And today we put that brick back in with glue, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we sheathe over the top. So anything that's glued and laminated um, is stronger than the original, just straight grain timber. I should have brought down. I've got a piece of spotted gum upstairs that's been steam bent just to show you how strong it gets uh, when you do that. So. You know, as I said earlier, like we're carrying around that skeleton on the inside with an endoskeleton on the outside. Um, but you know, if we if we had um, a major collision, all that structure will will assist. Um, I'm not going to be about to go out and try it, but it will assist um, in the in the overall integrity. Sure. Okay. The next one is from uh, Dion Austin, and I think it's a comment rather than a question. He says, "Hi, Sean." Very interesting presentation. Obviously a challenge, but a worthwhile one. You might remember Lenny Holbrook, who helped prepare radar after an earlier accident. He mentioned that Charlie Rossman used to own her. Yeah, well, it's quite interesting. Uh, Lenny's work is still there because the collision bulkhead was never put back in. Uh, so radar failed to achieve reverse going into the key one day. And... Uh, and uh, basically hit pretty hard 
and put a major um, major damage to the stem. There's actually in one of those earlier shots, there's a there's a the stem put on top of the other piece of stem. Uh, so that work was done back in those days, and um, this very small collision bulkhead was never refitted, um, only a small section of it. So we haven't changed any of that, curiously enough. It's still there. So I went through with the the new surveyors, and we went through the compartments, and obviously they'd work it out then that there's enough buoyancy between the, the watertight um, compartments. Mm -hmm. Um, Michael James says, this has been a great presentation full of interesting techniques and procedures used to restore radar. Thanks for this. And then Arvind Jess Slayag says, was there any dry film thickness and wet film thickness required just like in metal coating that is exposed to um, marine? Yeah, we use, we use DFTs. Yeah, we use a bit of, but yeah, in the painting, in the painting coatings, yes. And um, it's quite interesting that we have a standard operational procedure of, I have to read it out every morning because we do volatile organic compound checks. Because VOC checks standard operating procedure, DFT, DFT and moisture meter readings and coating diaries will be recorded for every job. Um, so now what comes with that, um, once you become a defence provider is that even poor old radar didn't escape that. <laughs> so, so everything, uh, everything was done to, to DFT. So we actually, in the painting sense, um, we use the material. Um, what's, what's it called? Duropox. Um, so it's a one coating system, and uh, so all that colour isn't primed. It's uh, a Duropox system. So you lay down layers of basically matte pigment. And then you put a clear over the top, which isn't an activator, but it's the UV stabilisation. Um, the reason why I chose Duropox is I was working towards this 4th of March launch date. I didn't have a lot of wriggle room, um, but also that it, um, it doesn't need priming. And also it's a slightly matte finish. And as I said, if you can read, you can paint. And I was concerned that if I went to ultra gloss, it would show all of my sins. Um, so I got away with that one. So yes, the short answer is yes, we use DFTs. Um, what easy with metal, we've been struggling um, by doing it dry film thickness testing um, in uh, the other mediums. We're painting a carbon fiber boat tomorrow um, with a clear coat finish. And uh, we're using a combination of well, a guy that we trained here, he's now Quite a famous uh, painter, Cam Smith, with Yacht Mod. Um, and uh, we've told him to come back into the family. We've got to do all DFTs, et cetera. So that'll be interesting tomorrow, we're to say. Okay. Um, having a look here. Uh, Gregor McFarlane says, Great work, Sean. Thanks. A non technical question. When I was a kid in the mid 1970s, I seem to recall there was a piano on board radar. <laughs> this was the case. Is there still a piano on board? There's no, there's no piano on board now. There was a piano on board. Now the thing is, um, as I've got, well, more aware, I suppose, I actually realised that I'm quite short. Um, we had a prime minister once by the name of John Howard, and I was at a function with him, and I kept looking at his feet, and uh, the prime minister said. Um, is there something wrong with my shoes, Sean? And I said, um, Prime Minister, with respect, um, I used to be a shoe salesman, but I noted that your shoes are of a normal height and uh, people have always said that you're not very tall and we appear to be exactly the same height. And uh, Mr Howard said, Sean, you are short. Uh, now, radar, I can just stand up comfortably down below. And uh, the modern female and male, uh, females in particular seem to be eating a lot of chicken, um, have got very tall. Uh, so uni parties, et cetera, they stand between the deck beams. So in the day when it had the piano on board, um, in that era, I would hazard a guess that the populace was a bit shorter than today. Uh, so no, that was a long with an answer, but uh, yeah, she did have a piano, um, but it doesn't have that today.
Okay, well, that looks like the end of the questions. Does anybody have any more that they wish to ask? Hang on. Uh, looks like there's something else popped in here. Uh, Arvin Jess Layag says, what is the maximum passenger capacity of the radar? Is there any detainment on board? Her maximum capacity is 220, but it's 220 transport. So, you know, you're, you're basically standing like, like, like this, uh, but that's her maximum capacity. It's a very, um, it's a very comfortable boat. At uh, the hundred mark, um, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of seating for the. We had uh, Samoan dancers on board um, as the opening of the Biennale, and uh, we performed down below, and we took off all the, all the seating to do that. Um, she was uh, curiously, um, she was the very first licensed floating premise in Sydney Harbour. Um, and we have now got her alcohol licence back again. Um, Entertainment-wise, um, fairly basic in the way of uh, speaker system, but um, you know there's 240 generating um, on board, and you know DJs have been on board, etc. Um, you know these days it's just plug in the Bluetoothy thing, isn't it? Please? That's nice. Yeah. I can be your entertainment, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that looks like the end of the questions, unless there's any more to uh, to come in. If there's no more, well, then I'll um, proceed. Many thanks, Sean, for your presentation. On behalf of RONA, I'm RSP, Engineers Australia, and all participants.